bunched together a group of people deliberately chosen for strong religious feelings, and you have a practical guarantee of dark morbidities expressed in crime, perversion, and insanity. HP Lovecraft thou shalt not refer to the Adeptus Auroratus as Bolta bitches, nor shalt thou go anywhere near our sisters during the time of their red rage, lest thou wish to be the first human to enter orbit without the aid of a shuttle. Space Marine Guideline 1 Page 13 Codex starts praise be the emperor and pass the ammunition. For what one doesn't cure the other will dark heresy inquisitors handbook sisters of battle are essentially Warhammer 40k's female equivalent of space marines black templars. Warriors devoted to the emperor. Although they lack the genetic modification of their beefier brethren. They also wear their iconic specially made power armor and are armed mainly with the ubiquitous bolter and chain sword. Though they also have a particular fondness for flamers. The Sisters of Battle are also known as the Daughters of the Emperor, and officially as the Adeptus Sororitas, though the Adeptus Sororitas refers to their entire organization. While the term Sisters of Battle refers only to their militant branch, that said, each sister is a fully trained special forces soldier regardless of specialty. They are more colloquially known by players as Bolter Bitches Babes or Nuns with Guns almost always resulting in an awkward boner. They are not to be confused with female space marines, though they were the marines military police and the oldie road trader. Sisters of battle are part of the Akulshiaki, the religious arm of imperial government, and sometimes work with the inquisitions which hunters. In the 36th millennium, the Akulshiaki's pope, a guy called Goj Van Dyer, attained the dual position of Akulshiak and master of the administratum effectively giving him control over everyone in the Imperium, including nearly all of its armed forces, with the exception of the Space Marines and Adeptus Mechanicus. Pretty much everyone had to do what he said or face a slow and agonizing death. Unfortunately for everyone who wasn't lucky enough to be a Space Marine or Tech Priest, he was also completely insane, and his rule was so devastating that it came to be known as the Reign of Blood leading to untold billions of deaths across the Imperium, which in turn led to violent warp storms the likes of which wouldn't be seen again until the formation of the Great Rift 5000 years later. During this period, Van Dyer discovered a force of warrior nuns living on the feudal world of San Lair known as the Daughters of the Emperor. Although they initially didn't want anything to do with him, he convinced them that he was the Emperor's chosen by having his bodyguard shoot him while he was protected by the force field of Erisarius. Because the relatively primitive Daughters of the Emperor had never seen a force field before, they assumed that this meant Van Dyer was protected by the Emperor and happily joined him. Rechristened as the Brides of the Emperor, they served as Vandar's personal bodyguards, shock troops, servants, and concubines. With a force of hyper-loyal battle sisters at his command, Vandar became effectively untouchable. Proven when he had the sisters execute all of the High Lords of Terror, which he quickly replaced with his cronies. Suffice to say, things looked pretty bleak. Of course, this state of affairs couldn't last forever. Late in his reign, a preacher known as Sebastian Thor rose to prominence in the Imperium, leading a massive crusade to terror to take down Van Dyer once and for all. Agreeing that they too were sick of the High Lord, the Space Marines and Adeptus Mechanicus joined forces and launched an assault on terror, matching themselves against Fraterist Templars and the Daughters of the Emperor. Unfortunately for them, the Daughters numbered around 10,000 women by this point, and they were battle-hardened, motivated, and armed to the teeth. The siege dragged on interminably, with no end in sight. Getting desperate, the Space Marines contacted the Adeptus Custodes, who had remained neutral for most of the siege, but agreed to help the insurrectionists out. Using secret passages to avoid the fighting, the Captain General of the Custodes presented himself to Lysha Dominica, the leader of the Brides of the Emperor. After debating with her for some time, the Captain General realized that she wasn't going to budge, and resorted to an extreme course of action. He took her and her five closest compatriots to the Imperial Palace and into the throne room of the Emperor himself. No one knows what happened there. But when the six women re-emerged, 
they went straight to Van Dyer, declared him a heretic of the highest degree, and beheaded him. In the aftermath of this conflict, the Imperium underwent a substantial political restructuring known as the Reformation, designed to prevent another reign of blood from ever occurring. As part of this restructuring, the High Lords decreed that the Ecclesiarchy was no longer allowed to maintain men under arms. Of course, while this meant the Ecclesiarchy had to disband their fleet and standing armies of fratarist Templars, the Sisters of Battle were technically allowed to remain, being women under arms and not men. While many point to this as an example of the idiocy of the High Lords of Terror, this easily circumventable wording was likely intentional, as unlike the other Ministorum forces, the Sisters of Battle had proven that their loyalty was to the Emperor first and the Ecclesiarchy second. Meaning that they could be relied upon to police the Ministorum as well as protect it. In combat, Sisters of Battle have something of an obsession with the purifying effects of flame, and generally choose equipment that allows them to cover heretics with as much holy Prometheum and thermal lances as possible. This philosophy is most obviously exemplified by the Immolator tank, essentially a rolling steel crate with giant flamethrowers or multi-melters stuck on it. They also have the Exorcist. A mobile pipe organ that shoots missiles less accurate than the whirlwind missile launcher or any imperial guard artillery but who cares the thought of organs launching missiles while playing epic mass complete with high gothic is fucking awesome damn it there are six main orders divided between the two convents that were separated during the reformation in the 36th millennium prioress based on terror and Sanctorum based on Ophelia Vizai. All minor orders are descended from one of these six. In general, Prioris behave like an actual military force, while Sanctorum is made up of fanatical sadomasochists. Convent Prioris orders, Argent Shroud, the lawful goods, are a rarity among imperial factions, in that they are described as being famous for selfless heroism, as well as altruism. For this reason, TG likes to fluff them as noble space paladins and she brass to the salamanders, probably waiting for their husband o lamenters to return. They wear silver. Ebon Chalice, the Vanilla Order. These sisters haven't changed a whole lot since they were first created, preferring to stick to their tried and tested methods. The most dedicated to flamers and sicker killing. They wear black and white. Sacred Rose. Cool, calm and collected. The most tactical sisters enjoy gunning their foes down in a more disciplined manner. If they were to get their own rules, their reds would have slow and purposeful. Their rules are dedicated to the new AD mechanic for the sisters in Miracle Die and its accumulation. The most defensively minded of all. They wear white. Convent Sanctorum orders. Bloody Rose. Aggressive as fuck. Aim to kill off their enemies as quickly as possible as they see no reason to let the heretic live any longer than necessary. They were red. Our martyred lady, the Pastergeneral Order, probably the ones who come to mind when people think of sisters. The amount of favoritism they receive from GW is slightly disturbing. Just take a look at the notable sororitas characters table below to get an idea of how they dominate sob fluff. The order itself is reputed as being determined even for sobs which is saying something, will not stop until their enemies are utterly destroyed. They wear black and red. They originally wore all black armor to show their mourning for Street Catherine, but changed the cloth to red to honor their losses during the Third War for Armageddon. Vanara's heart. Repent these sisters feel the guiltiest about that whole age of apostasy thing and as a result have an excess of BDSM berserkers, likely on constant lookout for the slightest sign of weakness in themselves or any allies serving alongside them. They wear the most black. Sororitas orders non-militant as mentioned in the opening. Not all of the adept sororitas are actually sisters of battle. A number of orders exist which officially serve non-combat related roles in imperial society although they tend to receive even less attention than their combat fighting sisters. The largest source of info on these sororitas thus far is the Blood of Martyrs source book for Dark Heresy, which specifies the three most important orders and mentions the existence of others. The latest AD Codex also covered the non-militant orders in some level of depth as well as expanding on a few of the lesser known orders that were originally mentioned in Blood of Martyrs. Orders Dialogus, 
These sororitas are dedicated to the studying of language, with tasks ranging from interpreting long-lost texts to accompanying imperial diplomats on contact missions with intelligent Xeno species. Thanks to their training, even the most average sororitas knows several hundred everyday human dialects and dozens of secret cants, ciphers, even Xeno's tongues. Sororitas of these orders are some of the few individuals judged worthy and capable of actually understanding the elder tongue. A linguistic talent shared only by some Ordo Xenos inquisitors and the occasional rogue trader. Diplomatora starts. Orders Famulus, figuratively the Bene Gesserit, without the kung fu skills from perfect body control. These sororitas serve intimately with the upper echelons of imperial society, acting as chamberlains, counselors, and consuls to the nobility. Their focus is on the spiritual and genetic purity of the human race, so they concern themselves with not only seeing to the education of nobles, but also secretly arranging alliances and marriages in the hope of preventing corruption and inbreeding from taking root. They are particularly involved in tracking the manifestations of saints, which makes them a popular ally for Thorian Inquisitors. This order very openly runs imperial aristocracy through a eugenics program, which is one of the prime reasons imperial nobles not only survived for Melinus without dying from inbreeding problems, but are actually in most ways superior to most of the rest of mankind and would remind you of their superior breed at any opportunity. However, considering the sheer amount of idiotic and despotic nobles that end up causing heretical uprisings throughout the Imperium, they clearly need more funding. Orders Hospitaller, Healers and Medics. These sororitas are amongst the most skilled and compassionate surgeons in the Imperium, meaning they are commonly found attached to the Imperial Guard. Given their mission, they are one of the more beloved orders by the common citizenry of the Imperium. Of course, this being the Imperium, they're also expert torturers often called upon for that purpose by the Echelshiarchy and the Inquisition. Though Inquisitors are cautioned against using hospitalers to keep important heretics alive, they have a bad tendency to forget about the future gains and instead take the Emperor's justice into their own hands. Handing them over after the interrogations is fully encouraged. Others, scores, perhaps even hundreds, of minor non-militant orders exist within the Adeptus Auratus. Orders Fenestrus maintain the armorless windows of imperial shrines and cathedrals. Now, you may say WTF that is such a waste of manpower, but you should think about the fact that the divine power of Big E keeps chaos influence away and the Imperium makes sure that its places of worship are able to brainwash you into the soul protecting doctrine as much as as possible, and fabulous windows are an easy eye catcher. Orders Madriga, compose the temple choirs. Again, they are here to brainwash the population into compliance with the soul protecting imperial cult. Orders Sabine. Suborders of the Famulus. Infiltrate newly rediscovered worlds and prepare them for the Mishnarius Galactia by religious subversion. Producing fake evidence that the local head god and the emperor are one and the same and if polytheistic assigning the lesser gods as local personifications of imperial saints. Within a generation. A human infant born on such a world can be found killing his grandparents Xeno friends, and it only takes that long if the Sabine are working without any support. When the time comes, the populace, even if previously politically divided, welcomes imperial compliance with open arms and rejoins the greater mass of humanity. Orders Planxilium leading processionals on holy days. Once again, they are here to indoctrinate the masses. Orders Pronitus. Specialist suborders of the Dialogus, retrieving, repairing, and guarding holy relics from around the Imperium. Orders Vespilla, sanctifying the dead and forensic specialists, probably hospitaler specialist suborder as there is a good bit of overlap. Ranks of the Adeptus Sororitus ranks novice, the lowest ranks among the sisters. They are raised so that their faith burns hotter than flame and they are trained to be capable of enduring hardships and practice self-denial so that they may be pure. The vast majority come from the scholar progenium and they are picked from notably talented and zealous female progena. Coming from here, they are already fanatically indoctrinated to the imperial cult and are capable of basic weapons maintenance, legible in both the local variants, sector-wide minimum 
of low gothic and in high gothic and also familiar with the imperium of man on an institutional level. Some orders may recruit from promising children who are made to undergo trials like the Adeptus Astartes due to their recruits. Constantia. Sisters in the final stages of basic training. They learn to use the sacred weapons of the order, principally the holy bolter and to deny the deceits of heresy. Cantus. A Cantus. Having mastered basic combat skills, now learned specialized abilities so that they may be multi-purpose tools in the Emperor's service. To cure, learn, counsel or kill. Only after this may sisters be assigned their final places in their order. Novitiate. A novitiate has completed her training as a novice. Constantia and Cantus. She only has to take her final vows to the Emperor to take her place as a full sister. Of course, it takes a fair bit of service in novitiate squads to earn the right to take said vows. Sister. Sisters have taken their vows to the Emperor and are ready to be deployed to the field. Sister Superior. Nkos who lead squads into battle. Sisters Superior are veterans who can guide their sisters in battle. Legatine. Legatines are sisters who are among the greatest of warriors, healers and spiritual leaders in an order. They inspire devotion and have political power. Most usually go on to become commanders. Palatine. Palatines are junior officers who are experienced and fierce warriors who lead their sisters to battle. Promoted to Canonus. A Canonus is an overall senior commanding officer of one of the order's militant, each a veteran warrior of hundreds of battles. Their leadership. Tactical and strategic acumen and faith in the Emperor is second to none in their command. This rank has the following sub-ranks. Canonus Commander leads a commandery of sisters. Canonus Preceptor leads a preceptory of multiple commanderies. Canonus Superior the overall commander of an order militant. Prioress one of two canonesses in charge of the convents. The Prioress of Convent Sanctorum is on Affilia Vi and the Prioress of Convent Prioress is on Terra. Abbas Sanctorum. The Prioress of the Convent Prioress on Terra. And a High Lord of Terra. She is the overall commander of the Adeptus Auroritus and is assisted by her fellow Prioress of the Convent Sanctorum. Sister Morvan Val of the Order of the Argent Shroud is the current Abbess. The position is necessarily political, as opposed to a legatine. Palatine and Canonus having political power they can use, being part of the Senatorum Imperialis, the galactic government of all law-abiding humans, though the current holder is more keen on having her secondaries handle those duties while she fights on the front lines. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk, one stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Orders Militant Tactical Specializations Battle Sister. The rank and file of the Orders Militant. Battle Sisters have completed their training and taken their vows in the Emperor's service. Militant. The first rank achieved beyond the most basic after they have begun combat operations. Elohim. The next rank after militant. Displaying they have shed blood in the emperor's name by their own will. Dominion. The most aggressive warriors of the order. Equipped with special weapons like storm bolters, flamers and meltagons. Retributor. The sisters who believe the emperor guides their shots become the retributors. The heavy weapons specialists of the orders most frequently carry heavy bolters, heavy flamers and multi-melters. Seraphim. Only the best of the sisters can join the elite jetpack assault teams, equipped with double bolt pistols, hand flamers or inferno pistols. Zephyrim. Some sisters achieve direct and personal connection with Emperor's divine might and can only speak in a tongue that the sisters believe only the purest of soul can understand. Being fanatical even by order militant standards, 
Zephyrim sisters are given jetpacks like Seraphim but also use melee weapons rather than multiple pistols. Celestians. Celestians are sisters who have proven themselves above and beyond their fellows. Veterans of hundreds of battles. They are assigned as elite shock troops or honor guard. The best among them. Celestians superior. Assist canonesses in the day-to-day -day affairs of their orders. Orders Famulus and Dialogus ranks Famula advance. A rank common to the sisters of the orders Famulus, who devote themselves to diplomacy and the fine arts of negotiation. They are experts at dealing with the different adepta of the Imperium and broker alliances and agreements between fractious power blocks, guilds and noble houses of many different Imperial worlds. Their primary goal is to preserve the Imperium's order and stability and ensure that those who rule or uphold the sinews of Imperial commerce are also working towards this goal. Their task, however, enables them to covertly monitor those they serve for signs of corruption or heresy. Dialogus Advance A Dialogus Advance is a rank of the Order's Dialogus, the sisters who focus their attention on the arts of the scholar, Serving as translators and expert advisors for imperial and planetary authorities in many fields. The armor of their faith makes them far less subject to petty corruption or hubris than others. The arts of the Dialogus are of obvious use to both the Adeptus Ministerum and, most particularly, the Ordos of the Inquisition. As they are experts at unlocking hidden codes and obscure references, dragging the faintest hint of heresy into the light. Nunciate Advance. The rank of Nunciate or Messenger is afforded to those among the Order's Famulus and Dialogus who excel not only in their crafts, but who are also noted for their skills in leadership and experience are dealing with the Imperium's hierarchy. Such individuals are often entrusted to act on their own to represent their order, or are tasked as close advisors to highly important individuals such as inquisitors and imperial military officers and civilian administrators. Orders Hospitaller ranks Hospitaller Advance. A rank of the Sisters of the Orders Hospitaller, who serve as physicians and offer palliative care at the front lines of the Imperium's many war zones and disaster areas. To the common citizenry, they are saintly figures beyond reproach, but they are no more forgiving nor compassionate than the Battle Sisters of the Orders militant if confronted by heresy or the works of the ruinous powers. Curia Advance a senior rank of the Sisters of the Orders Hospitaller. The Curia Advance has been forged in the crucible of war and catastrophe, honed by faith and discipline. These sisters' skills encompass not only the healer's arts, but also personal survival and the stewardship of those under their care in the harshest and most deadly of circumstances. These hospitalers must know when to heal, when to give the final mercy and when to watch for the hidden enemy. Almonus Advance. This is the senior most rank of the Sisters Hospitaller. These sisters are as hardened to the horrors of the battlefield as any war veteran. Many of these experienced hospitalers are called upon by both the Inquisition and the Astra Militarum to put their extensive skills and knowledge of Medici to darker ends in the service of the Imperium. Daily Rituals 4 o'clock. Rivali. The sisters are roused from their beds on the hard stone floor. 5 o'clock. Grooming. The sisters shower. Comb their hair and brush their teeth. This is the point where roughly 80% of all activities involving the sisters is imagined. 6 o'clock, matins, a light prayer session of 2 hours in total silence. 8 o'clock, breakfast, a light meal of flavorless gruel, as anything more enjoyable is an indulgence of the flesh and thus not to be tolerated. 8 10, morning target practice, the sisters assemble for target practice with roughly 50% more praying than other target practice sessions. 11 o'clock, physical training and self-mortification. The sisters train their bodies, before whipping themselves and each other. This is where the other 20% of sisters smut happens. 12 o'clock, ritual abstention from lunch. 12.05, meditation. The sisters are encouraged to reflect on the weaknesses of flesh and the unnecessary nature of midday meals. 1300 hours. Midday hike. The sisters indulge in a scenic hike, in full power armor. 1500 hours. The executions of guardsmen found to show insufficient faith in the god emperor. Harbor excessive sympathy for mutants, be in possession of improperly shined boots, be equity with improperly maintained lass riffles and to have insufficient faith in the god emperor for good measure 1600 hours 
Battle practice. The sisters gather to practice fighting with their extremely lethal weapons. Sparring combat with each at full power is mandatory. 1800 hours. Vespers. A light prayer session of 2 hours. In slightly louder silence. 20 hundred hours surprise inspection. The sisters are inspected to ensure proper faith and equipment maintenance. 2030. A second. Even more surprising inspection. 2100 hours. Evening meal. A flavorless meal of light salad. Water and baked chicken breast. Low fat. 2200 hours. Camp line and bedtime. Sisters snuff back in first edition. They were present fluff only as an order that was essentially the inquisition for everyone including the inquisition. Like an inquisition internal affairs branch. A who watches the watchman deal. And space marines. This would change in later editions. When they eventually get their own codex. In 1997. When the necrons were launched. Games Workshop had them face the sisters in a battle report which the sisters lost. The result of this battle report then became the Sanctuary 101 fluff. Games Workshop liked the result so much that they decided the sisters of battle should get slaughtered all the time. Unless they are falling to chaos. Obviously. Some fans blame popular GW whipping boy Matt Spiritual Liege Ward for this tendency, but it was there long before he got here and it continues to exist after he left. One way of looking at this is that it's the Wharf effect, aka, Avatar of Kane effect, in action. G-dubs need someone to take it up the ass to sell how powerful crafty the beg of the week is. But stomping the guard isn't all that impressive because of their eternal cannon for the shtick. Stomping the space marines would make the poster boys of the franchise look weak. And the Skaterii are fairly obscure next to the prior two as well as being the Admech Imperial Guard in almost all their books. The sisters, by comparison, fall into the spot where they're theoretically powerful enough to sell the antagonist as a credible threat without making a majorly popular faction look weak and without needing much in universe justification as to why they're around, as would be the case with the Skaterii and Marines. The other, of course, is that GW can't into good writing. Please note that while far TGUYS masturbate furiously to fanfics of sisters engaging in BDSM fetish sex with the likes of other lesbian sisters, servitors, children, scholar progenium cadets, elder, dark elder, half elder or even the likes of Nurgle, all of the below actually canonically fucking happened. It should also be worth noting that they are getting stomped by their own fucking allies in most of these. Some highlights include some of the Dialogus Order and some Battle Sisters turned to chaos by a slanishy keeper of secrets. A whole order mind controlled by one chaos seeker. Fucking go to. This happened again in the Cyphus Kane books. Although it was only a tiny convent with a couple of squads of sisters. Not her entire order, and said Sika was also a direct lieutenant of the despoiler himself who was capable of controlling entire planets. An order is present in another Cyphus Kane book, wherein they're tricked into exterminating the workers of a mining outpost and sheltering a rogue inquisitor. In an unrelated matter, they nearly cost the Imperial Guard a crucial battle against the Tyranids because they couldn't keep their bloodlust in check. Only Cyphus came calling them out for leaving countless civilians to be slaughtered in their temples as they pushed forward made them reconsider. That said, it's one of the kinder portrayals in this list, because the sisters in that battle do manage to make it back to the defense lines, and the entire order dies in a later battle covering the commissar's exit in repentance. A strike force of Celestians and an Inquisitor being killed, cannibalized and sacrificed by the Sons of Malice a starts chapter for disturbing their victory rights and falsely accusing the chapter of heresy. To be fair, a small force of sisters against an entire chapter still doesn't excuse a cannibalism, though, a whole shrine world of sisters killed by a demon engine powered by rage. It shrugs off Meltus, Meltabums and multiple exorcist volleys, and the efforts of a number of salamanders in Terminator armor. A living saint even gives up her divinity, not to be confused with virginity, to stop it by speaking the bound demon's true name. Her order had a vow of silence. Probably so the audio recording team could save costs on the speaking roles for the audio drama. 
therefore weakening it after her aura of peace causes it to calm down and shrink down to the size of a man instead of a massive demon walker. The demon is then destroyed when its shell is broken after a space marine decides to throw a thunder hammer at it. We are not making this shit up. A detachment of sisters killed by grey knights, their bodies sliced open and their blood applied to the grey knight's armor, so the grey knights can be immune to the blood tide's effects. Though some of the sisters were immune with faith alone. Make of that what you will. The blood tide was retconned in the most recent Grey Knights Codex to instead go down holding the line long enough for their Grey Knight allies to finish off the demons. Still losing. But at least this time they die with dignity. In another instance of Grey Knight on Sororita violence. During the climax of the first novel of the Grey Knight series. A detachment of sisters led by Cadonis Ludmilla is tricked by a chaos turned inquisitor into thinking that the Grey Knights pursuing it are chaos space marines. A few pages later, said detachment gets kamikaze by said Grey Knight strike cruiser, which itself was shot down by Imperial Navy ships fooled into thinking that it was chaos. Starting to see a pattern here surprisingly. The only dudes that die from the crash are Imperial Guard and PDF. The sisters survive but only to get the Ever Emperor love and shit beaten out of them by the surviving Grey Knights. The sisters pull no punches, however, and do manage to take out a few of Alaric's squadmates. So power to them. But wait. Seeing as this was written by a much more competent author, unlike the ambiguous piece of shite fluff written by a certain spiritual leech, both sides figure out that this was part of an elaborate case of just as planned. They stop fighting. Even more shockingly, the person who ends it is Canonus Ludmilla. After noticing the fuckhood books bolted on the GK's mighty pauldrons, and team up to take down the big baddie. In the campaign for Dawn of War, Soulstorm, sisters under the command of Canonus Selina Regna were one of three imperial factions involved in the core of a conflict who failed to get on the same page and ended up being slaughtered by the orcs under the command of Gorgut Sedanta. At least this time was an embarrassment for the Imperium all around. The Blood Ravens Space Marines lost three companies in this conflict because they were led by a bald idiot with an over fondness for drop pods who was put in charge by their traitor chapter master who wasn't discovered until it was almost too late later and the Imperial Guard took orc boots so far up their asses that they all died tasting squig leather while their leader slunk out of the system with his tail between his legs. But what really stings about this is that the sisters were hostile to the guard because they suspected them of causing the war storm that instigated the conflict and they were entirely right, as the chaos ending reveals that the storm was triggered by an imperial guardsman who turned out to be a latent sickness for Rudops, the of our martyred lady the canonist from the cover of the second edition codex, a steadfast, calculating woman who operates with a high degree of precision. Ephriel Stern Order of our martyred lady also known as the thrice born and the demonifuge, a living weapon against chaos with incredible supernatural power. She traveled to the Black Library with an exiled Holoquin in order to better understand and harness her powers. She eventually reappeared during the Indomitus Crusade and proved vital in dealing with the Necrons in the Pariah Nexus as due to her powers being faith based and not psychic they could not be suppressed. Mirial Sabathiel Order of Our Martyred Lady Formerly Former Sister Superior of the Order of Our Martyred Lady and one of the very few sisters who fell to chaos. Specifically, Slanesh Worship, Marian Order of Our Martyred Lady, Celestian Superior of the Order of Our Martyred Lady and protagonist of Swallow's Sister of Battle Books. Best known for her independent, headstrong attitude as well as her creative interpretation of orders. While this frequently gets her into trouble with her superiors, it also makes her uniquely qualified for handling situations that require quick action and outside the box thinking. Saint Celeste in order of our martyred lady, formerly, a sister who became one of the most famous living saints in the Imperium. Best known for her angelic presence, relentless optimism, and resurrection powers. The latter of which makes her nearly impossible to kill. She's also heavily implied to be the imperial equivalent of a demon prince Balam Heresy Canonus Eren Sithina Order of Piercing Thorn, Minoris. After completely eradicating her own order on suspicion of corruption, she became Canonus Errant, 
a vaguely defined position that involves a lot of us kicking. Inquisitors wish they were as scary as her, allied with the Black Dragons and Commissar Yerik. Also she can apparently move fast enough to cast Bolt of Fire and block Lathfar. Saint Catherine Order of the Fiery Heart a living saint and whose death caused her order to rename themselves to the Order of Our Martyred Lady. Also, it's her armor and sword that are now wielded by Saint Celestin. Canonus Superior Junitharuta Order of Our Martyred Lady a new canonus revealed for the new sub lineup. After the cathedral she was fighting in collapsed on her. She punished the cathedral for trying to kill her by turning its unbroken pulpit into her personal weapons platform. 